let's go get started here. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Dan from Dan's Test Prep. This is Tutor Tuesday. And we're going to go over SAT and ACT style questions. So anybody have any topics they'd like to submit? I'll pull up some questions for you guys. And we can start from there. Nice. We've got a question here. Why is it so blurry? Is it just me? Wait, got it. Okay, so we got a reading question here. I also saw a question in the chat about ACT and SAT. Yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of good articles out there already on Google, but basically, a the uh, SAT is only digital now. The ACT I think is a digital option, but that's the main difference right now as well as uh, the SAT consists of a reading and writing section and a math section. The ACT has uh, reading, and then it has English, it has math, and it has science. So it has four separate categories instead of just two. Yeah, ACT has a digital option and it's just the same as the paper test. It's not any shorter or anything like that, so I don't know. I would probably still take it on paper, but Let's go over this uh, question right here, this reading question. It says, which finding, if true, would most directly support the researcher's hypothesis? So I'm going to need to know what the researcher's hypothesis is in the first place. Uh, it's kind of long, but we can still read the whole thing. It says, in the mountains of Brazil, Barbacenia tomentosa and Barbacenia macranta Two plants in the Velociaceae. Uh, okay. In this family, establish them on soilless, nutrient poor patches of quartzite rock. Plant ecologists Anna Abrahau and Patricia de Brito use microscopic analysis to determine the roots of these plants grow directly into quartzite, have clusters of fine hair near the root tip. Further analysis indicated these hairs secrete both malic and citric acids. Okay. Honestly, I don't think we needed to read that. That's like a whole lot of fluff. Because it says here the researchers hypothesize that plants depend on dissolving underlying rock with these acids, as the process not only creates channels for continued growth, but releases phosphates that provide the vital nutrient phosphorus. What are you guys thinking? So the hypothesis is that the plants depend on dissolving underlying rock. It creates not only creates channels for continued growth, but also releases phosphates that provide the vital nutrient phosphorus. I see an answer choice that stands out here. And it's yeah, it is gonna be C. If our roots of these plants are carving new entry points into the rocks, even when cracks are already readily available, then that would show like these uh, plants are continuing to dissolve rock because dissolving, spe specifically the process of dissolving, is creating benefits for them. Um, we don't need to, we can't really say anything about the acids in different proportions or other species or, um, you know, the only answer choice that matches here is the one that talks about uh, carving these entry points into rocks, dissolving rocks, even when there's cracks already available. Let's see another reading question here. And you guys can feel free to submit all your questions as well. So this looks like a rhetorical synthesis question where has a student has taken some notes. The student wants to compare two women's contributions to the March on Washington, which choice most effectively uses relevant information from the notes to accomplish this goal. 
Uh, let's see. So March on Washington. There's Anna Hedgeman, one of the March organizers, was a political advisor. Civil rights activist Daisy Bates was a journalist. Hedgeman worked behind this. So here's what each woman did. It says, Hedgeman worked behind the scenes to make sure a woman was included in the lineup of speakers at the march. Bates was the sole woman to speak, delivering a brief but memorable address to the cheering crowd. And we want to compare the two women's contributions. So... Hedgeman and Bates contributed to the march in different ways. Bates, for example, delivered a brief but memorable address. I mean, A mentions both of them, but it doesn't compare what they did. B, uh, Hedgeman worked in politics and helped organize the march. Bates was a journalist and school de desegregation advocate. Uh, I mean, that does that talks about what B, what uh, Hedgeman did, but not what Bates did. C, although Hedgeman worked behind the scenes to make sure a woman of speaker was included, Bates was the sole woman to speak at the march. That one seems like it matches up quite well to me. So, um, I'm going to go with C for now. And D, many African-American women, including Bates and Hedgeman, fought for civil rights, but only one spoke at the march. What do you guys think? I see some math questions here. My guess, or my answer for this one is going to be C. Yep. Yeah, I guess we got to answer is agreeing. Yeah. This answer choice specifically highlights the contributions of both of the women. Okay, I see uh, math questions. Let me put this one in. I'll analyze D. Well, D doesn't talk about, it doesn't compare their two contributions. It just lists their names. We want to compare the two women's contributions. Okay, next question I see here is a math question. Or 14. What is one of the solutions to the given equation? It's a quadratic equation. Well, the way I would do this, well, if you're on digital SAT, you can, of course, graph it, but it might even be faster to just factor it as z minus something times z plus something. We're basically looking for uh, one well, multiplies to negative 24 and adds up to 10, positive 10. Right away, I'm thinking 6 and 4, but uh, that doesn't seem to work here. So my next guess is 2 and 12. And if we subtract 2 and add 12, negative 2 times 12 will multiply it to negative 24. Negative 2 plus 12 will add up to positive 10. So solving each of these pieces individually, z minus 2 equals 0, and z plus 12 equals 0, we could either grid in z equals to 2, or z equals to negative 12. And either of those would be acceptable answers. Okay, this, this next one looks kind of bit difficult. I mean, it looks like an SAT question, but maybe uh, a little bit harder than what you'd normally see. But it says the positive number A is 2,241% to 41%. So I'm going to convert that into a decimal uh, of the sum of the positive numbers B and C. And B is 83% of C. What percent of B is A? Well, I can substitute. I have this definition, right? I wrote both these equations. Let me substitute this in here. We might have to solve for it first, as in uh, B. Sorry. 
c is equal to b divided by 0 0.83. I can substitute that in. And then I get something like a in terms of b, 22.41 of b plus b over 0 0.83. We have to simplify this a bit. So 22.41 um, and then here I could, if I'm allowed to use the calculator here, I would just plug in 1 over 0 0.83 to figure out that that's about 1.2. 2048, so it's really 1b plus 1.2048b. So that's, if we add up how many b's we have, we have 2.2048b. And then we can multiply this out, 2048 times 22.41, we get a is equal to 49.41, 49.41b. So what percent of b is a? That's saying a is what percent of b? And a is 49 times b. So I'm going to go with 4,941% of b is that much larger than b. And remember to convert from decimal to percent, we multiply or divide by 100 or move the decimal point two places. Really, this is from Blue Book? This is so difficult. Well, I guess it's not that difficult. We laid out all the steps here, but I just haven't seen a question like that compared to like other SAT math problems. OK, I see more math. Let's go down here and paste that in. This one is talking about an electric field passing through a flat surface perpendicular to it. The electric flux of the electric field through the surface is the product of the electric field strength and the area of the surface. A certain flat surface consists of two adjacent squares where the side length in meters of the larger square is three times the side length in meters of the smaller square. Let me, let me draw this out. I'm kind of picturing like a smaller square right here with side length s, and then I'm picturing a larger square with a side length of 3s. An electric field with strength 29 volts per meter passes uniformly through the surface which is perpendicular to the electric field. If the total electric flux of the electric field through the surface is 4,640 volts times meters, what is the electric flux in volts times meters of the electric field through the larger square? I mean, it kind of looks like it's just asking for, uh, kind of, we could solve this with a proportion, right? If the, uh, the area of this square is just S squared, side length squared. The area of the larger square is 3s, the whole thing squared, so it's 9 units of s squared. So the total area is equal to 10s squared. So if we're just asking about the larger square, the larger square makes up 9 tenths of the area. If the total flux was 4640, what we're going to do is 4640 times 9 over 10 and I will pull out my calculator for that. And I get uh, 4,176 uh, volts times meters. Yeah, and that's the final answer for this one. OK, what else have we got? I'm going to pull up some questions of my own. Okay. I like 
math. So let's do nonlinear functions, because nonlinear functions is somehow one of the most common types of questions that I see pop up in these tests. SAT? SAT? You don't know what SAT is? Are you from the US? Then that makes sense. So the SAT is a high school, it's a test that you take in high school in the United States and sometimes international students will take it, but it's a, kind of an aptitude test that's used for college admissions here. So it's for some of the more prestigious universities, you need to score a, a lot more highly, or it can get you scholarships and things like that. Maybe you have something like that in your in your country, like a national sort of admissions test. Okay, I see ACT science problem, nice. Do you have to be smart to have a scholarship for merit? I would say that being smart plays into it and being hardworking as well. I mean, a lot of people can get merit scholarships from different levels of, like, you don't have to be the smartest guy ever. But if you want to get one for, like, the PSAT, for example, you do kind of have to grind and study and so you can get, like, national merit. Let's do, let me paste in this science question. Oh, that's like really small. Do you have a better picture of the passage? Yeah. So let me do this math problem while we wait. Um, this one says cow measured the temperature of a cup of hot chocolate placed in a room with a constant temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature of the hot chocolate was 185 Fahrenheit at 6 p.m. when it started cooling. The temperature of the hot chocolate was 156 degrees Fahrenheit at 6.05 p.m. and 135 at 6.10 p.m. The hot chocolate's temperature continued to decrease. Uh, so which of the following functions best models the temperature and minutes after it started cooling? Honestly, I don't really feel like making the function here, like constructing it. So. One thing we can do is we can just plug in different answer choices. So something like, so it's, it's M minutes after it started cooling, right? So five minutes after it started cooling, it should be 156 degrees Fahrenheit. I can plug in M equals five to all these, and it should give me temperature is equal to 156 degrees Fahrenheit. But how many of them actually do that? A will not give you that. B does not look like it'll give you that either. And then C, well actually let's check C. 180, so that's 115 times 0.75. No, that's not gonna match either. And so the last choice that we're left with is D. Let me make sure, so 70 plus 115 times 0.75. Yeah, that does give me around 156. So really, all I had to do is plug in five minutes after and see if it matched up. And there was only one answer choice that matched with that. Okay, let's do this. Looks like a Khan Academy problem on composite functions. I think composite functions show up every once in a while in an SAT. Though I don't remember seeing them for a while. Um, it says we have a functions f and g, which of the following best approximates the value of g of f of 3? Well, f of 3 means we take the function f and we look at what happens when we plug in the input 3. So f of 3 equals to 6. And so g of f of 3 we can replace with g of 6. 
So we go over to the input of 6, and it looks like g of 6 is approximately equal to 4. Oh, wait, I'm on the wrong function. I'm on, I'm on f. So if we go up g of 6, it's actually closer to 5. It's a little bit higher. And that matches up with answer choice C. Okay, this one looks like an ACT science problem. Let's try this one out. certain type of pea can have a spherical or dented shape and be green or yellow in color. Two unlinked genes that influence the shape and color of peas are gene S and gene G. Respectively, table one lists the possible shapes and colors of peas and gives the gene S and G genotypes responsible for each shape and color pair. Mm -hmm. So question one says, based on table one, which of the following crosses to produce only spherical yellow peas? We want only spherical yellow peas. That's going to be this genotype. It's going to have a dominant S gene and a recessive G gene. And so I guess you need to have a little bit of biology background for this one. But uh, even if you didn't, you can kind of guess that the one with a dominant S and a little g is going to have to come from choice C. And you can draw out the Punnett square for this. Punnett square. But you can also just kind of see that this is always going to give you a dominant S and a recessive G, like what they say here. I'm going to find a few more questions here. Number five. Uh, yeah, let's do number five on the previous question. What does number five say? Which of the following crosses has produced the greatest fraction of dented green peas? Dented green peas is what? Uh, recessive S and dominant G. So where are we going to have recessive S and dominant G? Well, in A, it's always going to have um, a dominant S, right? Because if we cross little s with big S, it's going to give us that dominant S. B is always going to give us a dominant S. C sometimes will give us a recessive S. But uh, D more often will give us that recessive S because we actually have that little S right here. And it will always give us a dominant G. So it's going to be D for this one.
yeah, Punnett squares are not too bad, but I would recommend knowing them for the ACT science section. Okay, let's do the one I pasted in chat. This one gives us an exponential function, f, and shows several values of x and the corresponding values of f of x. a is a constant greater than 1. Okay, so if k is a constant and f of k equals 29, what is the value of k? To be honest, I think that there's some kind of pattern here which we can just extend. Like, if we wanted to go extend a table to 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 and so on. We can even go like 9, 10. You'd see that it's always plus 4. For every change in x, the exponent on a gets up by 4. So here we'd have exponent of 13. Here we'd have 17, 21, 25, 29, 33, 37. And the question is asking about f of k equal to a to the power of 29. Well, that's going to be this row right here when we plug in 8. So that means k is equal to 8 to get a to the power of 29. question for you guys. This one gives us a function p, c is a constant, p of c is 10, what is the value of p of 12? Well, if p of c is 10, that means p of c is equal to c minus c squared plus 160 over 2c equals 10 or 160 over 2c is equal to 10. So from there we can get 2c equals 16 or c equals 8. Then when we plug in p of 12, we can actually substitute in c and get x minus 8 squared plus 160 over 2 times 8. That's uh, If we substitute that in, that's 12 minus 8 squared plus 160 over 16. 12 minus 8 is 4, so 4 squared is 16 plus 160 over 16. That's the same thing as 1 plus 10, which is uh, 11. Or we could have added 16 plus 160 to get 176. But this one you can do in your head that the answer is going to be 11. I see a math question here and a reading. Let me put those both in here. In the given equation, k is a constant. For what value of k are there no solutions? No solutions to the equation. That's pretty common on the SAT. No solutions means that both equations have the same slope and different intercepts. I mean, if you think about it, it's just two parallel lines that have the same slope. So if I'm looking at both equations, I want to expand things out just to make it a little bit easier for me to deal with. This is 320 plus 4n, and this is equal to 3kn. The slope here is 4n, 
The slope here should also be 4n, so we want to set 4 equal to 3k. Right? We want to set this, this slope here on the variable equal to this slope here, because k we can modify. It is a constant, but we can figure out what the value of that constant is. And so when you divide by 3, you get k equals 4 thirds. Now this uh, reading question looks like an inference question. It's asking us to logically complete the text. So logically complete the text. Herbivorous sauropod dinosaurs could grow more than 100 feet long and weigh up to 80 tons. And some researchers have attributed the evolution of sauropods to such massive sizes to increased plant production resulting from high levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide during, during the Mesozoic era. However, there's no evidence of significant spikes in carbon dioxide levels coinciding with relevant periods in sauropod evolution, such as when the first large sauropods appeared, when several sauropod lineages underwent further evolution towards gi gi gigantism, or when sauropods reached their maximum known sizes, suggesting that blank. Well, if there's no evidence in significant spikes in carbon dioxide levels, my guess is just that the evolution of those larger body sizes in sauropods did not depend on increased atmospheric carbon dioxide. Um, like none of the other choices really make sense. It's just that uh, it did not actually depend on what they originally thought it did. I think we went through a good set of questions here, guys. I think let's, uh, it's a pretty good stopping point for us. So let's plan on meeting next week, next Tuesday. But hopefully you guys all learn something new. And don't forget to check out my explore page. Okay.